Welcome to CG web seminar stroke webinar number 251. It's a lot of discussion, isn't it? It's a big resource now on YouTube too, with all of the webinars up there uh, and the conference as well. So do make use of that resource. We've noticed that the hits are going up all the time and we would expect the attention given to the webinar today on YouTube to considerably exceed the number of people who are coming in now to participate directly. But those who participate directly have an opportunity to share the immortalization of our speakers on YouTube. So today we're in Vietnam and what an important and interesting country it is educationally and in other ways. And our speakers are going to uh, open it up for us but um, let me first take you through the webinar protocols. Now, remember that the webinar is being recorded and uh, it will be posted on YouTube, as I said a moment ago, in due course, usually within 48 hours or so. We also post the chat from today's webinar, the public part of the chat on the CG website. Now, we advise you to keep yourself muted during the webinar because uh, sound can be picked up from your background and carried through to everyone in the webinar and at worst, it can actually stop the webinar. Uh, and perhaps it's best also to turn off your camera during the webinar, but um, we advise you to turn both the uh, microphone and the camera on when you come into the discussion in the Q&A part. We advise you to use the speaker view command in the top right hand there of the Zoom settings, which enables you to see who is speaking at any given time. Now, in relation to the Q&A discussion, we ask you to use the chat to indicate if you have a question or you'd like to make a statement in that discussion part once our speakers have finished. So write your question out. It's a good idea to do this early towards the end of the speaker's presentation is ideal because then you're most likely to be invited in to the speaking list. And I'll send you a, a note from the chair uh, telling you that we're about to invite you in after you've made your comment in the chat. Uh, and, and when we do invite you in, remember to turn on that microphone, turn on that camera if you can do that. And uh, when you, you're on, on, on uh, mic, uh, tell us who you are and where you are from. Now it's a pleasure to hand over to our speakers, uh, Ning Tran and uh, Lee Tran. Um, the Trans, in fact, are everywhere today in this webinar, and uh, we welcome them both. Uh, now Ning is uh, is a fellow, a research fellow in the College of Business and Economics at ANU, Australian National University, um, and he's taught and engaged with research in higher education for more than fifteen years published heavily on graduate employability, work integrated learning and uh, student experience in higher education. Uh, probably the most, most cited worldwide topic on higher education is student experience. Uh, Lee, professor in the School of Education at Deakin in Melbourne, um, Deakin University and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. And I'm sure Lee would not Want to, tell, want, want to tell you this herself, but that is a very difficult and distinguished appellation to have. It, the competition for future fellows uh, at Australian Research Council funding is, is very, very competitive, very tight. Um, Lee actually began her career as a lecturer in Hawaii University in uh, Vietnam prior to coming to Australia, where she did her doctorate and um, has risen through the ranks at Deakin. Uh, she, she works, as many people will know her work, I mean, she works on um, internationalization of education and international students. She's been focusing on international graduate employability and looking at Indo-Pacific trends in student mobility. And she does work on higher education in Vietnam and sets that in a comparative framework. So we look forward to, to your presentation and now the floor is yours. Excellent. Um, a very warm welcome to our seminar, everyone. And um, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity 
to convey our gracefulness to Professor Simon Magison and the Center for Global Higher Education for the opportunity for us to share the findings of our book, Student Experiences of Learning and Teaching Reforms in Vietnamese Higher Education. So Nghia and I are very delighted to share with you what we have learned in this space, especially from the experiences and perspective of our Vietnamese higher education students in the space of higher education reform. So I will start the um, presentation um, with the overview of Vietnamese higher education. And um, I will follow by sharing some of the key findings reporting in our book. So let me start by sharing my screen. Yeah, we can see that, Lee, thanks. Okay, yeah. Excellent. Okay, um, so let us start by explaining why this book and why the focus on student experiences. So in, in Vietnam, the implementation and the impacts of higher education reform are often Sorry. Um, just one second, I'll, one of my children is, yeah. These things happen and it's, um, it's always interesting with webinar formats, you get this kind of glimpse into people's lives, you know, sort of sometimes you see people's pianos and, and you know, all, the, all the flowers they have arranged for around their desks or, you know, all, all the books they have. And sometimes you see their families as well. Go on, Lee. Yes. Yeah, it's um, short of past 1 a.m. here. <laughs> and um, yeah, I went back from, from another panel as well. So it's a bit of um, <laughs> a big evening. Yep. Yeah, um, so the, the, the impacts and the implementation of higher education reforms are often viewed from the perspective of key stakeholders. Uh, for instance, university leaders, managers, teachers, and academics. However, students at key players in teaching and learning reforms are often underrepresented. And um, that's why we are keen to look at the effectiveness and the implementation of higher education reform from the perspective and experiences of um, students who are the key actors in the space. And um, this is a program of research that includes a couple of studies um, looking into different perspective and, and dimension of higher education reform, which I will talk about it in, in a minute. Um, so for you who are unfamiliar with the Vietnamese higher education, uh, we think that it was providing a brief overview of the higher education sector in Vietnam. So Vietnam is the world's 14th and ASEAN's third largest nation in terms of the population with um, over 97.4 million people. And for the academic year 2019 and um, 2020, there was about 1,672,000 students who was enrolled in higher education. And um, among them, around 103,000 were students of minority groups who often come from the rural and mountainous region of Vietnam. And, um, more than 912,000 were female students, um, according to the statistic from the Ministry of Education and Training. So female students make up um, a bit more than 54% of the total higher education population. And the proportion of female students undertaking higher education rose from 48% um, in 2006 
to um, above 54% um, 10 years after that. And for the same academic year, um, 2019 and 2020, about 447,000 Vietnamese students started higher education. And with um, nearly 80% of them in public university and the rest in non-public uh, university. Um, for the school leavers, the female tertiary enrollment ratio um, was considerably higher than the male ratio um, with 32% and 26% respectively. Now, um, let me move to the next slide. Um, we, we are going to report opportunities, challenges, as well as positive outcomes of higher education reform in Vietnam from the perspective of student that I mentioned earlier. But um, at the background of reforms, um, we would like to highlight some of the key challenges, uh, including finance, um, so overall, the Vietnamese higher education is quite underfinanced, um, not only compared to developed countries in the world, but also other countries in the region, including um, East Asia and Southeast Asia. So Vietnam GDP share of higher education funding uh, spending it just around 0.25% compared to Singapore, 1%, um, South Korea, 0.94%, um, Malaysia, 1.3%, and Thailand, 0.64%. Uh, um, and in terms of leadership and management, we will see during the, our presentation, it is one of the key areas of reform, um, because for a long time, Vietnam's higher education sector has been laden with the centralized plant leadership and management. In terms of curriculum teaching and learning, Vietnamese higher education um, has been identified as one of the key area for improvement uh, due to the disconnect between the curriculum and the demands of the labor market, as well as the social and economic needs of the country. And um, teaching, and learning um, is also identified as one of the main area for reform in different reform agendas over the past 25 years, um, mainly because of um, the teaching and learning methods that are not that um, student-centered and effective. And that is going hand in hand with not only um, the curriculum and methodology, but also student learning attitudes and habits. And um, finally, one of the main areas for improvement is the structural conditions hindering faculty development. Um, and that is again related to the issue of finance, salary facilities and the workload and the balance between teaching research and service. Um, and there are significant barriers that affect quality professional development as well as um, the quality of faculty. Um, I would like to um, go through a couple of higher education reform agenda in Vietnam. Um, so given the background of the challenges for teaching and learning and the reform of the system, the Vietnamese government has identified key areas deemed to be in need of improvement, including higher education autonomy and governance, curriculum, teaching and learning assessment, credits, employability, and internationalization. And um, in, in, in this um, program of research and in the book, we have um, based the discussion around one of the key milestones um, of higher education reform in Vietnam called higher education reform agenda um, by the government introduced through the resolution 14, 2005. And um, the second one is higher education law in 20, 
12. Um, the next one is strategy for higher ed, for education development for Vietnam for the period of um, 2011 and 2020. Um, and um, a couple of decrees that we also look at to analyze reform policy is decreed on um, foreign cooperation and investment in education launched in um, 2012. And that is followed by um, the decrease on foreign cooperation and investment in education introduced in 2018. Um, this decrease affects the um, internationalization policy and strategy in Vietnam a lot, um, including transnational education, research collaboration, and um, curriculum development and advanced program. And the other decree that we look at is decrease um, on the stratification and ranking of higher education. And um, lately, we also look at the amended higher education law introduced in 2018 and revised education law in um, 2019. So we have the chapter two of the book that analyzed in depth um, a different reform agenda in Vietnam, uh, opportunity challenges and effectiveness. Um, so what did we investigate? Um, first of all, we look at building a favorable learning environment for students and that is one of the focuses of our presentation today. Um, secondly, we look at student transition of first year into the university and um, follow that. We explore student experience with the use of credit-based training system, which is one of the major reforms in curriculum of the higher education sector in Vietnam. And um, in response to the issues of curriculum and teaching and learning methodology, we look at student-centered teaching current practice and um, barriers. And um, that is followed by the use of information and computer technology, communication technology in teaching and learning. Um, and at home, international education and how that affects graduates' employability. Um, and at being identified as one of the key areas for improvement um, in the reform agenda, we also look at student experiences with assessment practice and the washback effects on student learning. Um, and of course, work placement and the issue of employability, extracurricular activities and informal learning and the, the factors that facilitate as well as inhibit um, extra curriculum activities and the hidden curriculum. And we wrap up with um, student perspective on the values of undertaking university education. Okay, um, now I will move on to um, a bit detail about our um, study on building a favorable learning environment for students. Um, and this is based on a survey with um, 828 students about their experiences with the physical, academic, and servicing environment in more than um, 58 universities across Vietnam. So here you can see um, the key finding in relation to the learning environment in, um, in terms of physical learning environment, clearly um, students tend to be quite satisfied with the campus and facilities um, with um, 70, over 73% uh, happy with campus and facilities and that's followed by space and learning resources, 67% and then information technologies. In terms of um, the servicing environment that you can see from the findings here, um, students tend to be quite content with student loan and extracurricular activity services with 62% um, of them are quite happy with that. And that followed by learning and career development support services, which is quite interesting because um, career support activities um, are 
often considered as um, a new service on campus offer for, for um, students and um, that followed by K3 services. Um, in terms of the academic learning environment, um, up to 71% of them are happy with academic staff um, qualities, but um, clearly the level of satisfaction with professional staff quality is a bit lower. So in general, um, the key finding is that student was generally satisfied with the learning environment, um, but more attention should be paid to the maintenance of facilities and um, especially the operation of student related services, including service like um, career support and employability. Um, and comparing across their attitude toward professional and academic staff, as I mentioned earlier, they tend to be happier with um, the quality of academic staff. And while they acknowledge the contribution of professional staff, they believe that these staff should be more professional. And um, one of the key findings is that students from private institution was more satisfied with the physical environment and the facilities in their institution compared with their counterparts from public universities. Okay, so um, now we would like to share some of the findings about student center issues, practices, and um, barriers. Um, for, for this particular study, we um, conducted a quantitative one of how student center teaching has been implemented in Vietnamese University. And um, the data included 800 and 31 responses from students across 39 universities um, in an online survey. And we look at the implement, implementation of um, student-centered approach at both the institutional level, including leadership, management, and support, and the classroom level um, in relation to cost development, teaching and learning activities, teacher quality, and student-teacher report. Um, and notes that we, we um, ask students for their experiences and perspective on these two levels. And the key finding is that student-centered teaching has generally been practiced effectively at the classroom level. However, it seems that the implementation at the broader institutional level should be enhanced in order to create a more favorable envi environment um, for the implementation and support the implementation of student-centered teaching and learning um, at the classroom level. And I will go into detail with the data now. Um, so you can see the mean uh, as well as the um, SD. The, with the um, policy communication and learning support, we have the means of um, 3.88 and manage management of student learning experiences, um, 3.73, and that is followed by um, pro providing flexibility for student learning, 3.62. Um, and at the classroom level, we can see that the mean score um, tend to be considerably higher. Um, we can see that student Rate, rated the clarity in communication at the classroom level is um, quite high, uh, 4.28. And that is followed by the uh, mean score of 4.12 um, attributed to, in relation to teacher attributes and um, followed by 3.84 involving student in cost design and improvement and um, 3.81 um, related to conducting teaching and learning activities. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, clearly there is um, higher satisfaction among the student to what student center approach implemented at the classroom level compared to the institutional level. Okay, so um, 
Well, I would like to hand on to Gia um, to cover the, the other key findings of the research program and the book. And um, one of the key parts is um, extra work placement, extra curricular activities and employability that Gia is going to share. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. I'll stop sharing now. Yeah. All right, so thank you very much, um, Lee, for uh, the first part of the presentation. I will continue with the presentation by talking about student learning beyond the boundaries of the campus. And uh, like other universities around the world, Vietnamese universities are paying more attention to developing uh, student employability. So they use work into learnings, for example, work placement or internship. And um, the problems that we are facing is has a uh, limited connection with the uh, universities. Uh, sorry, the Vietnamese university has limited connection with industries. And the students seem to have a habit of dependent learn learner. Uh, so um, that can be challenges for the implementation of work placements in, in Vietnam. So we explore student experience with their internships and identify the influential factors of their internship performance. And uh, we designed a quantitative case studies, uh, taking into the case of one university in the south of Vietnam. So this university is um, a public one, multidisciplinary, and established after the year 2000. So it can represent quite a lot of universities in Vietnam at the moment. And um, we sent a survey to the students in that university, asking them if they have completed one internship within the previous two semester that they could participate in the survey. And in the end, we got 270 responses to the survey. And here are our findings. So in student experience, um, the internship contributed a lot to uh, the de development of the capital for their future career. So for example, consolidate their knowledge, further develop their technical skill, soft skills, um, it can also change their learning attitude and learning method. Um, it helped them to identify new career paths and also establish a social relationship with people from industry. So obviously internship experience and student experience was quite positive, but it's what is more interesting to me is that usually the internship is organized um, so that the student can develop some kinds of professional expertise. But in our study, um, the one that is highly rated by student is changing the learning attitude. And also the uh, internship is usually organized um, so that the student can make connection with professional in the workplace. And that can be one of the measure for them to get entry into the industry. Uh, but in our study, it seems that the student rate that learning outcome the lowest. And um, in our study, we also asked the student to rate um, the influence of 21 factors uh, to their performance in the internship. And then we extract these 21 variables into four principal components. And based on student rating, um, it's, it, it is reviewed that the student engagement is the most influential factors to their internship performance, followed by the support of the academic supervisor uh, support, then the industry mentors and the host uh, organization support. And finally, the institutional support. Um, it is not surprising to see that their engagement with the internship is the most influ influential one because it is consistent with other findings in other studies in other contexts. But what is interesting is about their second most uh, influential factor, that is the academic supervisor support. 
Um, we expect the student to go to the workplace and learn from the professionals in there, from the mentors, by observing uh, or by working. But in this case, they learn from the academic, academic supervisor. And that can be attributed back to the way that we organize the uh, uh, work placements. So in Vietnam, usually the student will be sent to the workplace and to do a project in there. And what they are required to do is to write a report about that project or writing a thesis out of that internship. So that is the only um, assessment piece. And rationally, students will focus on doing that so that they can pass the course. So that's the reason why they um, rank uh, academic supervisor support as the second uh, most influential factors. And that also explained for their very low ratings of uh, forging relationship with potential business partners during the internship. Uh, now let's move on and talk about the informal learning. Um, if we do research about student learning in Vietnamese university, it is not enough if we don't dive into the contributions of the extracurricular activities organized by the youth unions and its associates. Um, let me explain to you that the youth union and its associates, or the YUA, is actually a political social organization established by the Communist Party of Vietnam. And it is um, installed in all levels of education. And the primary purpose of um, the YUA is to train students in political education and also undertake some uh, social engagement or community engagement activities. So um, we try to explore student experience with uh, um, participations in these extracurricular activities and how their participation can contribute to the development of employability skills. And the, the way that we design our study is that we send the same survey to students of five universities at two points in time one in 2015 and the other one in 2019. So in the end, we got 797 responses from both times of survey. And the findings is that um, in student experience, the YUA uh, frequently organize extra curri curricular activities. Um, however, our analysis of men with needs use tests show that there was a decline tendencies in the frequencies of organizing these activities between the two points in time, especially for political education activities, work skill development activities, and special talent nurturing activities. Um, in the same manner, when we investigate about student participation in these extracurricular activities, um, they responded that they frequently participated in these activities. But between the two cohorts, 2015 and 2019, there was also a decline in their uh, frequencies of participations, um, especially for the uh, political education activities and special talent nurturing activity. We also asked the student to write 25 skills um, that they consider to be employability skills. Um, how those skills are developed through participation in extracurricular activities organized by the YUA. And so we extracted these 25 skills into six principal components. And the results show that in general, the student rated quite high in terms of the contributions of uh, participating in these extracurricular activities to their skill development. Uh, however, again, there was a decline in student experience about the contribution of these skills, of, 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 of participations in these activities to their skill development between the two cohort of 2015 and 2019. So why it is quite difficult to explain um, this phenomenon, um, based on my personal experience with one of the YUA leaders when I was working for one university in Vietnam, it seems like um, the YUA is no longer the only organization in the, in the university that can lead the student in uh, extracurricular activities or community engagement activities. Because with the society advanced and uh, more open, more dynamic, it seems like there are more um, social body that can lead the student in this regard. And for that reason, the student just like go out and participate in those activities. Um, and that can explain for the declines in the tendencies of participating in extracurricular activities organized by the YUA and also 
the contribution of these activities to their skill development. Um, another explanation is that it can be a result of our design of the study. Uh, because we use the same survey, we uh, target the same university students, um, but in the end, the two cohorts uh, comprise of different students, so they may have rate, um, rated the, the skills um, quite differently. The last empirical chapter in our book is about the perceived values of uh, undertaking university education. And um, we use a survey um, to send to students across um, different institutions in Vietnam. And in the end, we got 809 usable responses uh, from students of 38 institutions. And um, the main finding was that uh, we um, asked, asked a student to write the contributions of their university education to the development of 25 aspects of personal and uh, uh, professional growth. And then we extract these 25 items into four principal components named professional development, personal and interpersonal growth, scientific insight, and social engagement. So you can see on the table, the student rated that the university educations contribute a lot to professional development. Uh, personal and interpersonal growth and scientific insight. But then in terms of social engagement, it was rated very low compared to the other three dimensions. So you can see here 3.09 compared to more than 3.5. Um, and uh, we also ran one main Whitney U test uh, to compare the experience of the two student cohort, one from public and the other from private universities. And we see that the student from private university seemed to have a better um, experience with the values of the university education in terms of um, developing their social engagement and scientific insight. And uh, we also asked the student to rate their satisfaction level uh, with um, a numbers of uh, operational activities in the university. And you can see on the table, the top three uh, more satisfaction um, activities include career orientation activities, um, quality of teaching, extracurricular activities, so in here. And that is good news because these are the main activities uh, of the university. So at least they are happy with the quality of teaching. Um, they're happy with the way that we um, orient them for their future career. And that is also aligned with the purpose of Vietnamese higher education. Uh, defined in the high education law. However, when we look at the top three bottoms um, or the least satisfied um, activities, all of them are related to student service. So for example, sub services to support students who face difficulties, services to support first year student transitions and student learning support services in general. So um, this finding is quite consistent. Um, because like what Lee reported before in the first chapter of the book, um, the student reported that they were not very happy with the student support service. And the, in this study, um, it is, both studies was conducted independent, independently, but the findings were consistent. So I think that is something that we had to talk about. Um, we also asked a student about whether they think that the university education um, was values for money or not. And the response, the responses for the students show that 61.9% of the students say yes. 27.1% uh, was unsure and only 11% of them say no. Interestingly, when we compare the two group of public and private university students, um, the student from public institutions seem to have a positives about um, the value for monies of their university education compared to their peers in uh, private institution. This means that the tuition in public institution is lower than that of private institution. And uh, we also asked the student if they could choose again, would they change their institution to another one? Um, to our surprise, almost half of the students responded that they would like to change to a new institution. And about one third of them was unsure. Um, only 16.7% of them say, no, they will stay with the same university. We compared again, the, the, the public and private 
uh, institutional students, we found that even though the student from public institution was quite positive about the values for money of their university education, these are actually the group that want to change the institution. The 50%, more than 50% are versus 35%. Um, so that finding says something about the uh, experience with their university education. So it's been that even though um, the private institution may charge a higher tuition fee, still they meet the expectations and provide a student with a better uh, experience than those from the public institution. All right, so um, so far we could only give you a snapshot about our book project with five empirical chapters. Um, and we hope that it can give you some overviews about what is going on with the teaching learning reforms in Vietnamese universities uh, and also some obstacles. So in our project, we learned that there are some obstacles that we need to remove so that the reform can move forward. In terms of curriculum, we identified two big issues. The first one is the curriculum is quite rigid and this is also very theory focused. So we suggest that uh, in design and deliveries of the curriculum, there should be some more flexibility. So for example, we can give the students some right to choose the subject and the teacher to study with so that they can cater to their learning needs. The contents of the curriculum need to be updated regularly to maintain the latest knowledge and skills. And um, the content of the curriculum should also be more practical because that is one of the aspects that have been critiqued by many people uh, because the uh, uh, theory focus curriculum has already uh, made the students like unable to be employed by uh, industry. industry. Um, in terms of student, we identify some problems. So um, although many students have already developed their right attitude and engaged with their learning still, we found that many students don't um, engage with their learning and don't have the appropriate attitude for their learning. They still learn for grades, for degrees, or just to meet their family expectation. And they still hold on with the uh, dependent or exam-oriented learning habit. And they are unable to lead their own learning. They, they, they fail to adapt to new environment and get along with other people, which we believe to be very important attribute for university students. So we recommend that we need to establish the learning um, support services uh, to train students in learning abilities and to improve their uh, engagement with their learning. And in terms of teachers, we identified two main obstacles. Um, the first one is they disengage from the reforms just because they realize that those reforms may result in their social status to step down. In Vietnam, teaching is a noble career and teachers are respected by many people. Um, the reform, the teaching learning reforms, for example, the credit-based um, the credit-based um, training system or student-centered uh, teaching or formative assessment practices require them to share the power with the students. And for, for, that, for that reason, they just feel is it unacceptable. They feel that they are insecure of their roles in the, in the classroom. So they don't engage with the reforms. And also for others, um, they are eager to embrace with the reforms, but they lack expertise and they lack support. They, they don't have the support from the leaders leadership. So um, they might be hesitant in uh, embracing further with the reform. So we recommend that we need to increase teachers by in attitude with the reforms, for example, by engaging them with the de decision process or inform them with the policy and regulation about reforms and also to organize professional development activities so that they can feel more confident um, undertaking the task related to the reforms. Leadership, this is not the focus of our book. However, based on the students' feedback and experience, we detected that this, this can be one of the obstacles for the teaching and learning reforms in Vietnamese University. Uh, it is because there was some evidence about a lack of leadership or support in terms of leadership and management um, in uh, implementing teaching and learning reforms. So we suggest that um, um, they can choose an appropriate uh, approach to implement the reform because at the moment we have so many teaching and learning reform um, happening at the same time. And um, leadership should go in hand in hand with uh, management and support because we cannot tell 
students or teachers to engage with the reforms without giving support and proper management. And in our opinion, our, in our perspective, shared leadership can work well rather than the central leadership. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, facilities, and learning resources, our study showed that the Vietnamese university have already invested quite a lot on those regards. Um, what is missing is about the management and maintenance of these. Um, Non-curriculum activity, so we recommend that we need to enhance maintain and enhance the roles of the YUAs in meeting extra curricular activities and connect to uh, external stakeholders um, for the organization of these activities. Last but not least, external stakeholders. The issues at the moment of Vietnamese University is that they don't have a loss of connection with external stakeholders. So that prevent them from organizing like work-based uh, learning activities or even um, some uh, community engagement activities. So we recommend that we need to uh, enhance the connection with external stakeholders. And one of the practical way to do is that keeping in touch with our alumni and build a network from there. Just imagine that we have 2000 uh, graduates per year. So in 10 years, we have about 20,000. And we're just about like, if we can keep in touch with about 50% 50, 50 of them, then we have 10,000 and that is more than enough. So those people can come back and give like guest lectures, donate something, or can give the student internship opportunities. And that is good for student learning. And um, we also recommend that uh, the university should collaborate with international partners for internationalization activities, because those international partners might um, add some values, new perspective or new philosophy in teaching and learning uh, to the systems and uh, with this few local effects, uh, we believe that that can make some positive change in the teaching and learning reforms. All right, so this is our perspectives about a framework for um, teaching and learning reforms in Vietnamese University. So the yellow circle here, um, just imagine that is the field where the teaching and learning reform can occur. Um, it includes all of the systemic factors of the higher education system. It is powered by social, economic, cultural, and political factors. In there, the student are plays, and they engage with on-campus learning activities. However, not all of them can do that, so they need the support from the teachers, the university leaders, and the staff to build a student-centered institutional environment via the uh, provisions of infrastructure, facilities, learning resources, and support services. At the same time, students need to engage with off-campus learning activities. And um, this can be uh, facilitated or supported by external stakeholders. So those people can be alumni or anyone who are willing to share the expertise with the students and facilitate the training process of the university. And these external stakeholders can also be get involved in the on-campus learning activities, for example, to get advice on the content of the curriculum, to provide internship opportunities, or to run some practical workshop for professional development. Um, one final thought um, about our students. So no matter how we invest in the reforms, if we don't change the student mindset about what and why they learn, then it will not happen, it will not work. So we need to focus on the students. We need to play the student in the center of um, the teaching and learning reforms and uh, stimulate their awareness about their learning process. They should know clearly about their learning purpose. So before we um, conclude our presentation, we would like to acknowledge the valuable support of our colleagues for the studies and the contributions from our student participants. Um, we really appreciate your advice, support, and encouragement during the five year process of putting everything together in the final version of the book. We really, really appreciate that. Um, so thank you very much for your listening and we are open to questions, comments, or sharing your experience on the same topic. Nia and, uh, and Lee, thank you very much for that thorough explanation of the study.
uh, and uh, you know it's a good uh, it'll be a good item to have up on YouTube. I think people will be able to follow your study with it, go through your slides with interest and work out how to design something similar in their own environment. So that's very educationally helpful. Um, because we don't have much time left, what I'm going to do is bring in a group of people to ask questions. If we have a Q and A with individuals, we're going to run out of time after two people. Uh, and so I'll have to ask you to try to remember, use a, use a pen and pencil if necessary, you know, what each person has asked, because we do want you to respond. Um, I was going to ask you where this work will go next, and also to expand a little bit on this astonishing finding that most people who have been through the experience of an institution want to leave it and would rather go somewhere else. And you kind of wonder who owns somewhere else university because they're going to do awfully well in the, in the environment. Um, but you know, that is quite an astonishing finding. Usually people, most people will say they're satisfied with the place they went to and nearly everyone. Well, I think, you know, you've only got 16.7% saying that they would stay, you know, in the same place. They're quite sure that's very low. So I thought worth expanding on that. Um, now I'm going to bring in four people who have come in to the chat. The first one is uh, Asia Chowdhury. So Asia, can you come in at this point, please? Hello, Asia. I can hear a sound somewhere there. Yes. Got you. Good question, please, Asia. Yeah, my question is this: uh, Is your hello? Uh, is your research it is a discipline specific or it is a general approach to ask many institutions? Because in both cases, results could be different, and we can you can say uh, uh, either it is a particular discipline problem or it is uh, you can say it is a general problem in every institution. Yeah because it is a survey data conducted in quite generic terms and there are, there's potential for disciplinary variation. And we know a lot about student experience now through that disciplinary lens. So that can be quite an important aspect of the, of the, the study. Uh, Koa Lit, can you come in please? Um, yes, good evening from Vietnam uh, and good evening to Dr. Lee and Dr. Nghĩa. Welcome. So I am really impressed by your finding and especially the ones about students' employability and uh, internationalization. So I am uh, Hua and I am a recent graduate from RMIT University Vietnam with a major in translation and interpretation. And my question is, uh, is that based on my observation in the event that uh, international working standards are not matched with the local Vietnamese one? Uh, many of students like us find it's really difficult to adapt when applying and working locally because the, the standards between different locations are different. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you think uh, besides internationalization, uh, educational institutions should provide students with the uh, local point of view, or I mean the, uh, um, the uh, local working standards? so that a student can be more uh, flexible and more can, can adapt easily, uh, whether they apply to work internationally or whether they apply to work locally. That's my question. Thank you very much. Okay. Our third question will be from Thuy Tran. Thuy, can you come in, please? Yes. Good evening to everybody. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jit Li and Nang Nghĩa for your wonderful research. And um, I'm really concerned about the implementation of student-centered teaching approach at institutional level. And Jit Li, could you please share some of the barriers um, in implementing this approach uh, at institutional level? Because I see the, the, um, the mean score was the lowest. Um, and as far as um, regarding the providing uh, flexibility for student learning, because as far as I am observed, students are now in Vietnam are much more flexible in their learning 
So could you please also share some of the barriers in implementation? And could I please ask another question for Ms. So for Anita? Go ahead. Yes. So um, uh, I was very impressed by your findings, Anita, and I, 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 I'm very wondering about the contribution of informal learning to the learning skills of the students. Because as uh, I can see from your, your findings, uh, the contribution uh, of informal learning to improve the learning skills of the student was still very low uh, in your research. And, um, and I think that the learning skills of the student is the weakness of the student in Vietnam in, in general. And for lifelong learning, it is very important for them. So could you please um, uh, share some of your suggestion to improve their learning skills? Okay, there's quite a lot there. Uh, and one more. <laughs> Thank um, you. We'll take one more question. That'll be Le Nguyen uh, Huang Giang. Uh, who asked the last long question in the in the chat? Can you come in, please? Yes, thank you, Dr. Simon, and thank you, uh, Professor Lee Cheng and Dr. Nguyen Chen, for this wonderful research. So, I would like to um, ask about the methodology because I understand that this is the quantitative study. However, I think that could be um, looked at from the quality lens because, like, because I'm a quality researcher. So, I think that we would be able to learn more about uh, the student narratives because based on my observation, also my personal experience, um, the student experience when they they uh, return into the internship environment, the story totally <laughs> tells something different from the, 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 the numbers that um, from the quantitative perspective. And also interested in the internship part in your research because um, it has been situated in Vietnamese higher education context. So what are their institutional supports for students to earn their internship position? From experience, students have to, Vietnamese students have to apply for internship position by themselves and they are unpaid job. So this, this is quite disappointing uh, factors that can lower the student engagement in their internship uh, activities or duties. Um, because I'm located in Canada. So in Canada, we have the co-op operation um, can, to be considered as an internship part. Um, and in Canadian higher education, we, see, we call that experiential learning. And that's also paid job as well. And that also helps the student to gain hands-on experience when they, before they actually turn into the real working environment. So that's also my question about, I would like to hear your thoughts about this as well. So thank you very much. And I must apologize to our two excellent presenters because I've given you a big burden now to deal with this, uh, all these wonderful questions, wonderful you know issues that have been raised, but, and you've only got a short time. We usually cl close down by five past because people leave around about that point in larger numbers. So the floor is now yours and taking, you'll both want to speak. You've both been addressed directly, of course, and um, you know, take, take whichever order you wish. Sure. Um, can I start first, Mia? Yes, please. Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I really appreciate all the very helpful and, and insightful questions. Um, I would like to start first by briefly answering the first question on the context for the survey of um, student center teaching approach. Um, and Gia can, can add to that. So the, the survey is across different disciplines in a general context. Mm. And um, we use 40 items describing five different aspects of student-centered teaching approach implementation at the classroom level based on more student-centered teaching checklists of six dimension, attitudes, communication, program design, learning activities, assessment activities, and evaluation. We combine assessment activity and evaluation. And um, we use the, the five points like a scale, which in which one denoted very bad and five very good. And um, so can I also answer three questions in relation to 
student-centered teaching approach as well. So um, that is a very, very um, wonderful question uh, that we, we, we should talk about the barriers. So the key barriers um, that hinders the implementation of student-centered teaching approach at the classroom level is teachers' capabilities and strategies in order to engage and involve students in designing and co-designing the teaching and learning content and the curriculum. Um, but at the institution level, we also um, face the barriers in terms of communicating the mechanism in order to support the implementation of student-centered teaching approach and the autonomy that teacher has under the standard curriculum in order to be able to incorporate student autonomy and student opinion in designing teaching and learning and the curriculum. So here are the key barriers that I would like to share. Now I pass on to Nia for the other questions. Thank you. Um, thanks, Yili. Um, so I would like to respond to Kwale's uh, questions first. So he asked about uh, how we can develop a skill for students so that they can um, like develop their careers both locally and internationally. So I think um, whether you study in, in Vietnam or in Australia or so in the UK, um, the technical skills are quite the same uh, for every discipline and you can apply those skills everywhere you apply a job for. The thing here is, you need to develop other kinds of access before you can um, join into the workforce. So for example, the social network, cultural understanding, your psychological attributes, for example, are you flexible, are you adaptable, or are you resilient? And at the same time, you need to define who you are as well. That is your identity, who you are connected with. So those things are more important. So um, all in all, this is not just about a skill that you find uh, whether you can um, be successful in applying for a job and, and develop your careers or not. It is all about the way you use those assets for your purpose. So that is my, 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 my answer. So um, in your case, if you want to develop your careers in Vietnam, you need to focus on understanding about that labor market and use your access for that market. If you want to do it in an international level, like for example, move to the USA, for example, then definitely what you learn from, from Vietnam, the technical skills and expertise can be used, can be strengthened to the new labor market, but you need to make sure that you are familiar with that labor market as well. Um, and I would like to respond to Yang's questions about the internships and the difference between using uh, quantitative and qualitative data. So we completely understand that um, the student experience vary a lot between each individual student. And each student will have different narratives about what they experience with their internship. Um, but the purpose of our study is that we want to capture um, a general pictures about what happens with, with, with their internships. And, um, to measure the, the, the influence of these factors. So that's why we choose the quantitative um, study design. Um, when we do something like interview, we can capture some stories. So for example, usually when people do a qualitative study, they may interview about 15 uh, interns. So we can have 15 narratives, but the 15 narrative, my question is whether we can ensure that they can, um, represent all of the stories of all of the interns out there or not. Um, so I don't know whether my, my, my answer um, uh, address your concern or not, but that is my perspective. I think we still have two more questions. One question from Asia. Um, so she asked, I remember that she asked about when we design um, um, our research for the book, uh, do we take the perspective of like each institution uh, or uh, disciplines or the whole sector? So our perspective is that we try to capture the reforms across the systems. Although there are some variants in the way that we design different empirical chapters, um, in the end, um, 
we fundamentally focus on the systems as a whole, with one or two chapter focus on one discipline, one university. And um, in response to tweets, questions about um, developing student skills via extra curricular activities, um, it is quite difficult to advise you about how to uh, develop the student skills in this area because it is their discretion uh, to decide whether they will join in into these activities or not because anyway it is named extra curricular activities right um, another issue that we should concern when talking about extra curricular activities organized by the yua is that some activities are compulsory and some activity activities are not compulsory um, in my previous studies um, about the yua contributions to employability uh, skill development it seems like the students um, are quite selective in their approach um, and participation in these activities. Um, they, they find, if they find that these activities are relevant to what they want to achieve, then they will participate in, and otherwise they will not. So um, again, that is totally dependent on student discretions and the choice. Um, we don't have the way, the best way to help them with that. Um, we can only do to meet the general need of the group, the selective um, demand of the group, rather than like uh, meeting the demands of every student in terms of uh, skill development. And there, I think. I think call it a day it's getting late um and um we're really grateful to everyone for staying in because that doesn't always happen with our webinars we've held um at, we peaked at 62 which is a very large group and we've still got 50 people with us um I want to thank all of our friends and colleagues from vietnam who took part today i know how late it is for you and it just goes to show what a strong education country vietnam is you know what a strong teaching and learning culture and you know, the only thing really holding back education in tertiary level in Vietnam is resources. You know, we know that when the country becomes stronger economically and is able to support kind of stronger infrastructure and pay its teachers better, so they won't have to work two jobs all the time, uh, then uh, things are really going to take off. So Vietnam is going to become a great higher and tertiary education system with great research. It will happen. It is the future. It hasn't happened quite yet, but the, the people are there to carry it through when the resources are available at a national level and can be allocated properly to education. So, you know, I think the future is really bright and Vietnam is going to make a major contribution to the world conversation about education. I've got no doubt. Uh, it's a big country. People don't always realise how large it is in terms of population. Um, thank you to the two speakers, uh, Dear and, and Lee, for your contribution. Very late for you. Sorry about the family, Lee. I mean, it's really tough, isn't it, when we do these things in the middle of the night and wake people up and so on. It is hard, but really appreciate, you know, your contribution right to our program always is very, very good. Uh, and, and, and Nia, really good to have such a careful, you know, thoughtful, in-depth presentation from you today. Really good standard of work. Great stuff. And we'll have you both back, I hope, in our webinars. Um, do propose further webinars to us. We're very interested in Vietnam and it should be brought to the world. Um, thank you very much to the two of you again. And let me remind everyone that our next webinar, which is uh, next Tuesday, uh, is going to be about um, uh, the um, cross-cultural dialogue between Anglo-American and Chinese higher education. So we look forward to seeing you then and bye for now.